talking about um, a woman by the name of Candace. And uh, Candace lived in the first century and she was a queen. And she was a queen of Ethiopia. And it's interesting that we have her name because uh, the story I wanna tell you here at the beginning really doesn't involve her so much as it involves someone who was her servant. And his name, we don't know. So we know her name, her name was Candace. She was queen of Ethiopia and she had this servant. We don't know his name, but the story, uh, it really centers on him. So as a queen, you can imagine she was very wealthy. She had uh, a huge treasury, lots of riches in it. And this unnamed person, that's really the center of our story as we start tonight, he was in charge of all that. He was in charge of her treasury. He had great authority. He was a eunuch. He served the queen in this way. And somehow, it's uh, interesting to figure out how this happened. But all the way down there in Ethiopia, he had a desire to travel all the way to Jerusalem from Ethiopia. That's probably, I went on Google Earth to find out just about how, how far they got a cool feature where you can drag a line and find out about the distance from one place to another. It's about 1,500 miles somewhere in Ethiopia, all the way up to Jerusalem, about 1,500 miles. That's like from here to Colorado. Of course, he made that journey, you know, on, uh, as many people would, either on camel or a donkey or a horse, a chariot. And it's amazing to think that this man went 1,500 miles to Jerusalem, where the temple of the Lord was, so that he could worship the Lord. And it, perhaps it was while he was there that he acquired a scroll. And it was a copy of the writings of one of the Old Testament prophets. And we'll get back to that in just a minute. Our story also involves a man named Philip. So you have this Ethiopian eunuch, charge of the treasury of, the, uh, of this queen, and he goes all the way to Jerusalem. He's a part of our story, and so was this man named Philip. He was a servant of God. And we pick up our story as this unnamed eunuch is heading back home from Jerusalem to Ethiopia. And maybe, I don't know if this is surprising. Some of you already know what I'm talking about, but this story is actually in our Bible. If you want to follow along, that's fine, but you can just listen and enjoy uh, the story. It's in Acts chapter 8, and I'm going to start reading at verse 26. Acts chapter 8 and verse 26 says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. It is a deserted place. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah, the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Now you and I, like we can smile as we think about that. That passage that the eunuch was reading in Isaiah, we know who that is, right? <laughs> we know who that's speaking about. It's a, it's a, a curious thing to, to picture this man just 
perplexed as he read this, wondering, who, who is this talking about? Is, this, is the writer talking about himself? Or I like how he says it, is this some other man? <laughs> says, then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Now, and we already knew that. <laughs> we knew that the passage was speaking of Jesus. Uh, but this, this man did not know. And so it would have been so fun to see uh, this man come to understand who this prophecy was speaking about. Hundreds of years, hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born, the prophets like Isaiah were speaking of the suffering of the Messiah and of the humiliation of the Messiah and of the death of the Messiah. Those verses in Isaiah that he was reading, they make us think of Good Friday, don't they? Think of Jesus, especially the picture of a lamb. And I hope tonight in particular that we really grab a hold of the sweetness of that, uh, that, way of looking at him as a lamb it's seeing him bound being led away to the cross to the slaughter silent and humiliated being treated unjustly and even being killed as the prophet isaiah said his life is taken from the earth and what an image for us to have on such a day as today, you know? To think of our Savior as a lamb. I mean, that's Passover. You know, your thoughts go right to that, that image of a lamb. And to see our Savior as, a, as the lamb, really, right? The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Innocent meek, harmless, gentle, a lamb. And what I'd like to do here tonight is just really tell the story. I'll make a comment here and there, but I just really want to tell the story. It's all familiar to us, but I hope that you'll just enjoy along with me just thinking of the story of what we're, what we're remembering on, on such a day as this. It's a day that we set aside to remember the suffering of Christ and the death of Christ. And we all know Sunday's coming, but it's okay to just concentrate some of our time, our thoughts on what it is that he endured and to unfold the story again, to behold tonight with you, to just behold the Lamb of God tonight with you, to think of him being bound again, to think of him being led away and silent, innocent, meek, harmless, and gentle humiliated, all of these things that even the prophet Isaiah spoke about. As I start this story out, you know, our minds are going to see those things, those details that were prophesied about him long before he ever came. You won't be able to follow along too well because I'm, I, what I did was I, I went through all four gospels and I kind of just took things from each gospel, put it together as one story with some of the details that we find in all four gospels. So um, just enjoy the story. You know, it's a true story, obviously. Enjoy the story as I just go through it. And as we bring to remembrance what it is that our Lord suffered. The place that we're going to start in our story, it's a very appropriate place to start because something happens here that we need to have in mind before we even get into the whole imagery of his humiliation uh, of how they treated him, how they beat him, of his blood and, and, and all of these things, before we even get into all of that, before we get to the cross, this first thing that we have in our first scene is so very important to give us the proper perspective on everything. And it starts off in the garden. So we start the story with this. Jesus went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his di disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, 
having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? The main thing I was referring to that we want to have us help give perspective is still ahead of us, but this ties in with it. Jesus knew everything that was going to happen to him. I mean, <sighs> everything that was going to happen to him. He knew it in advance. This wasn't something that took him by surprise. He knew very well what was before him. And knowing that, he still went forward and asked those who were coming to arrest him, whom are you seeking? What a thing to have in mind here at the very beginning is just, he knew this. He knew everything that was going to happen to him and he still went forward. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas who betrayed him also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. I think many of us know the detail, this detail here in the story. John's the only one who tells us about it. What a fascinating detail. And this is the one that I was referring to that we wanna make sure that before we even get into these passages about his suffering, that we recognize that as they came to arrest him, he spoke and, and those enemies of his, they drew back and they fell to the ground. What a scene to imagine. It reminds us that the Lord said, I lay down my life that I may take it again. And I love this. No one takes it from me. Don't you love that? No one takes it from me. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. So what a great thing to just have in mind as we move forward into some of these very sorrowful scenes and details that we know he knew what was going to happen. He knew it, and he went forward into it anyways. And as they came to arrest him, he showed forth his power, drove his enemies to the ground. And yet from that moment after, he would allow himself to be bound, to be led away, to be taken to the cross. So the story continues. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest servant and cut off his right ear. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into your sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? We, we kind of stumble over that thought of what that means, the cup that the father had given our Lord to drink, that cup of suffering, um, the cup of wrath, what that entailed. And the Lord took it. The Lord accepted it. And the time had come now for him to drink it. Then the detachment of troops and the captain of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus, and bound him. And here's the first time we're going to hear this. We'll hear it a few times. And they led him away. And I just want you, along with me, to just get that image of a sheep being led off to the slaughter. And here, Jesus, he's shown his power, but now he submits to what it is that's going to take place and they bind him and they lead him away. I don't know if you can picture that. They arrive at uh, Annas' place, it says the high priest, then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews meet and in secret I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, 
do you answer the high priest like that? I, I, I pause on, on this place here because it seems that this is the first time ever that someone actually strikes the Lord. It's the first time recorded that someone actually strikes him. Uh, and it's, it's pretty monumental here what is about to take place. And here is just a, uh, just a, a hint of what it is that's coming. He strikes Jesus with the palm of his hand. Jesus answered him, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if, well, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. And they led Jesus away. Again, I'm, I won't say this every time, but just to make sure we're getting that imagery here. And they led Jesus away. Just the lamb is going off. Uh, this meek and humble, quiet lamb is being led off. They led Jesus away to the high priest. And with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies were not consistent. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Right there, there's that prophecy, right? There's that prophecy of Isaiah that as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he not opened not his mouth. And here they are hurling every kind of accusation. It doesn't even matter if it lines up with what everyone else is saying. It doesn't matter if it's true, obviously. And they're hurling everything against him, and he answers nothing. He's silent. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. And, uh, you know, we marvel a lot of the details of what takes place on, uh, on this evening. And this next detail, it's. Um, I don't know, it's, it says, and some began to spit on him. The humiliation, and to blindfold him, and to beat him, and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers received him with blows. Immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He answered and said to him, it is as you say. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, do you answer nothing? See how many things of which they accuse you. But Jesus still answered nothing so that Pilate marveled. I, I, I'm sure he never saw anything like that. <laughs> he probably never saw anything like that. So Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no fault in this man. This will come up again. I won't bring it up every time, but just to draw your attention uh, to the fact that the Lord was innocent. Just as that lamb that sacrificed that Passover, that lamb was innocent. I find no fault in this man, he said. But they were the more fierce, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked if the man were a Galilean. As soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Now, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad.
For he desired for a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. Pilate went out again to the Jews and said, I find no fault in him at all. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And we know it's, it's, it's passed over so briefly, just a couple of words, they scourged him. And I'm just thinking now from memory of uh, the prophets in the Psalms saying, uh, the plowers have plowed my back. They made their furrows long. And just as a, a farmer takes the edge of his plow and digs it into the earth and opens it up so that he can plant, the psalmist, in speaking of the Messiah's suffering, says, they've done that to my back. As they scourged him. You don't even, you know, we don't even like to just even put words to it. We just want to almost leave it alone, right? We just... We just don't want to, to see it too clearly. Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium. And they called together the whole garrison. They clothed him with purple. And they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head. And began to salute him, hail king of the Jews. And they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him. And bowing the knee, they worshipped him. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. And Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. You know, Pilate was determined to let him go. And I think he, it wasn't right for Pilate to have him scourged, but it was almost like he said, Let, maybe this will suffice, suffice the people. Maybe this will just settle them down in their rage and in their envy against him. Maybe if I present him now, they will turn from their ultimate objective that they have in mind to do to him. But that's not what happened. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered, we have a law. And according to the law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid. It, I didn't include this part of the story but you'll remember that Pilate's wife she was tormented in a dream and she sent to her husband don't have anything to do with that just man I've suffered many things in a dream because of him and I wonder if that when he got that message it unsettled him and now here the people are saying that he claimed to be the son of God and when he heard that he was the more afraid he went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus where are you from but Jesus gave him no answer can i just remind you again to just that picture of the lamb just this innocent silent one this pure one uh, jesus gave him no answer then pilate said to him are you not speaking to me do you not know that i have authority to crucify you and authority to release you Jesus answered, and we know these words, don't we? You could have no authority or no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. 
Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in the place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover in about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. They took the purple off him, put on his own clothes, and led him out to crucify him. Of all the phrases that I was thinking about with this whole story as it unfolds, that one made me think most of what Isaiah prophesied. Uh, led as a sheep to the slaughter. They led him out to crucify him. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then Jesus said, Forgive them, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots, and the people stood looking on. Even the rulers sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there. They filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, we just love this, right? We love these words. <laughs> he said, it is finished. When Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It's just a... Uh, it's just good. I know it's very somber, um, moving, melancholy, just weighty, all of these things to bring us ultimately to that scene, to see him bow his head, right? To see him bow his head and die. But this is what he came to do, right? He came to give his life. It's a trustworthy saying that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and this was the only way to do it. He had to lay down his life. And we just pause there, and on a day like today, we just we let it strike us again. We let it move us again to see the love of our Savior enduring what he endured at the hands of men and even at the hand of God, what he endured and bearing away our sin in his own body on the tree, 
loving us unto blood as we sing and pouring out his life even to death. We know what, there's just something, I mean, it's like, I'm so glad that we just don't leave it there, right? I mean, we know Sunday's coming, but even there in that moment, you remember we read this, Greg even read it. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. <laughs> uh, immediately, there's this declaration of victory. <laughs> immediately, there's this, this awesome scene. And what does this mean? What does it all mean? It's, we know this, right? The veil, it separated man from God. If you want to simplify it to as best as you can, it just God was on one side, man was on the other side, and man could not draw near to God. The veil separated even the high priest could only in, go in one day, you know, a year. And I'm sure he was quite terrified when he went in there, you know. And this veil just separated. And then when the moment when Christ died, that veil was torn. And we love this, right? I know that we know this. And I know that we love this. It was torn from top to bottom, clearly showing to us who it was that tore that curtain. It was God that tore that curtain. And when Christ died, it was as if God was declaring to the whole world, you can approach me now. <laughs> you can draw near to me now through Christ. Not only that, it says the earth quaked, the rocks were split. I mean, when, when he bowed his head, I mean, it was, it, it, I mean, those who were standing there, some of them were absolutely moved by everything that they saw and witnessed, right? Declaring that this truly was a righteous man, that this was the son of God. Well, we're pretty much at the end of our story here. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and then they might be taken away. And the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen, this is John the Apostle speaking, he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. You know, that's what they did with the Passover lamb, right? They didn't break one of the bones of the Passover lamb. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And that's where our story ends for Friday, right? That's where our story ends for Friday. But as we often say, <laughs> Sunday's coming. We, we know this is not the end of the story. The resurrection is coming. But it's okay tonight, anyways. It's okay this evening to just let our focus fall on him as the lamb, led to the slaughter. This is our savior. It was a lamb, I'll read the verse again that we started off with, the the word that that Ethiopian eunuch was reading. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth. Of whom does this speak? That's what he asked, right? Of whom does this speak? Asked the Ethiopian eunuch. It speaks of Jesus speaks of our Savior, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. 
the one who loved us, who gave himself for us. May our hearts just, you know, be filled with affection for him, you know. May, may our lives be marked by devotion to him. And, and may our eyes be longing to see him, <laughs> to behold him, right? We've beheld the Lamb of God tonight by faith through the scriptures. One day we're going to see him face to face. This very one who, uh, who loved us unto blood, uh, we're going to see him, the one who gave his life for us. So I hope you enjoyed just, uh, just doing that with me tonight and just going through the familiar, the old, old story. <laughs> Tell me the old, old story. Well, that's kind of what we did, right? And um, I hope our, our hearts are just filled with a, a warmth for him, a love and devotion for him. Let's uh, just close in prayer. <clears throat> our precious Savior, it's such a delight to have thought about you tonight. Some of these uh, scenes, these images are tough for us, and we wonder at them. We kind of stand in awe of them, and, um, and yet they're written for us to know these things in your word. We are to know the things that you endured for us, the greatness of your suffering, although we will, we will always stand in awe of it. We will always stand just on the outskirts of it, trying to maybe glimpse a little bit more of what it meant for you, the Holy One, to bear away our sin, what it meant for you to suffer as you did, to, to take that cup and to drink it up and to drink it until there was not a drop left. As we often sing, you drank it up, but you left the love for us. And we're just, uh, we're, we're ones who have been redeemed. We just want to tell you tonight that we love you and we're so thankful for what you've done for us. And uh, so it was good for us to remember you together again tonight. And we look forward to Sunday. We know what's coming. But in this evening, we just, we, we, we can appreciate just the somberness of thinking of what it is that you endured on the cross. So we love you and we just bow before you and give thanks that you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And uh, we do this, do this in your sight, Father, giving thanks for him in his name. Amen.